Mr. The Speaker. member for Jandicott. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, thank you. And please let me congratulate you on your election to the position of the Speaker of this House. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wajak Nunga people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future. To Mark McGowan, Premier of the West Australian, Premier of Western Australia and proud leader of the West Australian Labour Party. I say thank you and congratulations. It was your clear vision for the state, your strong leadership and tireless efforts that led to the formation of this new government in emphatic style. And I'm honoured to be part of a team that will roll up its sleeves and work to deliver that vision for all West Australians. I would also like to acknowledge the Honourable Sue Ellery as the first female leader of the government in the Upper House, and the Honourable Kate Doubts, who has been elected as the first female president of the Legislative Council. Congratulations. This is a win for diversity and equality. I look around this chamber today, Mr. Speaker, and I know that I am amongst an unprecedented number of new members, each of whom I would like to congratulate, along with my colleagues who have returned for another term of government. And I'm confident that although we begin our parliamentary work together in the midst of the challenging economic circumstances, the next four years will set a new course of positivity for the state and the people of Western Australia. Mr. Speaker, I would like to acknowledge the former member of Janicott, Joe Francis, and wish him and his family the very best. This is a proud and extraordinary occasion. In 40 days' time, it will be the 20th anniversary of my arrival in Western Australia as a migrant from India. I have lived in and around the seat of Janicott for the past 20 years. I have raised my beautiful family. I have created businesses, made lifelong friends, and served in local government. I have been welcomed into the citizenship of this amazing country, and I know how blessed I am to be an Australian. So, to stand here today as one of the two Indian-born members of an Australian parliament and dedicate myself to the service of the Janicott community and to the people of Western Australia, it's like a dream. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I come from a farming family in the district of Dhanu, 130 kilometres north of Bombay on the western Indian coast. My family still farms chiku, a tropical fruit known here as sapota or mud apple. Those once successful farms helped support my education in Australia, but today the revenue from farming in India has fallen sharply. Indeed, my family earns far less now in real terms than 40 years ago. My great-grandfather's heart and soul was in growing fruit and vegetable, and he won many awards for agriculture from the then British Raj. My family is most proud of the Kesri Hind, also known as the Emperor of India Medal for Public Service, which was awarded to my great-grandfather for advancement of public interest in India. My father, Yazdi, who is here today in the public gallery, is wearing that medal. Proud of you. An energetic man, my great-grandfather, was also the founding member and chairman of the Danu Road Janta Cooperative Bank. As there was no electricity in the village at that time, he started a successful movement for establishing a powerhouse. I'm glad to say we do not have these issues in Jandakot, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> My grandfather was the deputy mayor of Danu for 16 years. At this time, there was no prayer hall to carry out our Zoroastrian customs and rituals. The religion of my family and I is Zoroastrianism, an ancient Persian religion. We worship fire, and our mantras are similar in vibrations 
to that of the Hindu mantras. The people of Danu had to undergo great hardship to travel to the nearest prayer hall. So my grandfather and great-grandfather bought a small piece of land and built a fire temple, which, stands, which still stands and is used to this date. My grandfather was also responsible for establishing the first English secondary school in Danu, with the help of the Bishop of Bombay and subsequently the first college. My father has carried forward the rich, leg the cultural legacy and tradition of our family, continuing to manage and develop the farming and other businesses. Along with other farmers, my father, with his sharp business acumen and philanthropic nature, started an auction house where chikus brought in by smaller farmers are auctioned to the highest bidder. This means that farmers who previously struggled to make a living due to the middlemen are now earning good money for their produce. As I've said, it will shortly be 20 years since I first arrived in Perth. I remember the day I left Mumbai as a naive and fresh-faced 21-year-old commerce graduate on the 4th of July 1997 to start the 10-hour journey to my new home. I left a colorful and fast-paced public relations role with MTV Music Television Station in India. Oh. I thought WA would be the perfect place to continue my postgraduate studies. I knew Perth had beautiful beaches, a strong club cricket culture, and being the cricket tragic I am, I was of course lured by the Perth's historic cricket ground, the Wacker. <laughs> my arrival in the suburbs of Leeming and studying my masters in international business at ECU's at ECU marked the beginning of my first decade of my life in Australia spent living in the Jandicott electorate. My first job in Perth was as a night shift attendant at a service station in O'Connor. I remember a colleague bought me a fair dinkum book of Aussie slang. <laughs> the first two phrases I learned were rip snorter and get me a tinny. <laughs> Of course, I learned a lot more colorful Aussie slang since, but none appropriate for this chamber, acting Madam Speaker. I then worked as a food picker at Woolworths and then went on to work at Telstra and Centrelink before I was finally able to realize my dream and buy my first business, the Success Post Office. I have been, a, I have been business minded since I was a child. My grandfather had a dairy farm and I used to take a lot of interest in counting cows and how many were being milked and the number of employees. During the school holidays, I used to put on magic shows and sell tickets to the parents. We used to pull mangoes from the trees and sell them on the local market to make some pocket money. What I'm trying to impart to the members in the house, Ms. Madam Acting Speaker, is that my life trajectory has followed the common path of many hundreds of thousands of migrants who have seen the benefits and opportunities that Australia has to offer. I have seen a lot of change in my local community during the past 20 years, and it brings me back to the seat of Jandakot. I would like to share with members some of the history of the area, founded by migrants based on market gardens and food production which resonates strongly with my own migrant history and experience. As you would be aware, Madam Acting Speaker, significant population growth in this state, and particularly in the southern corridor of Perth, during the past decade has created the need for many redistributions of state electoral boundaries, including mine. A relatively young electorate, the new seat of Jandakot, was created in 2008. Comprising 94 square kilometers, it includes parts of five local government areas, the city of Armadale, Canning, Coburn, Cosnells, Melville. Jandakot's suburbs include Canningville, Forestdale, Harrisdale, Jandakot, Leeming, Pierre Waters, and Treby. According to the iconic local history text Coburn by Michael Burson, Jandakot was settled in the late 1890s of the back of a series of gold rushes to Western Australia. The, first states, the state's first premier, Sir John Forrest, 
set about creating agricultural areas for the new settlers to farm, and in 1890, a market garden precinct was declared at Jandakot. The challenges for those pioneers faced in making a sustainable living, working the area's characteristics, heavily leach gray sands is worth mentioning, as those who were successful are credited with establishing the market gardens that provided the main source of nourishment for Perth's growing population over the many years. The optimism, resilience, determination of those early settlers, men and women, who were not afraid to try, fail, and try again until they succeeded, are the character traits which are also commonly found in today's Jandakot community. This enterprising attitude is reflected by recent ABS statistics, which show that business growth is booming in Forestdale, Harrisdale, Pira Waters region, with a 57% increase in micro businesses between 2014 and 2016, the fourth highest growth rate of a region in Australia and the highest in Western Australia. This growth is set to continue throughout the next decade. Further similarities can be drawn between the issues facing the Jandakot communities of then and now, the need for connectivity and access between settler farms and Fremantle and Perth. Was the catalyst to establishing of the Jandakot Roads Board District in 1891. The Roads Board's first project was the building of Nicholson Road. By the turn of the century, it became clear to the settlers that in order to make the most of their farmlets, the district would need a railway. A vigorous campaign saw the Fremantle to Jandakot line open in 1906, extended to Armadale in 1908. The Armadale Jandakot Railway closed in 1964, and the road transport once again influenced the development. The challenges of transport and the battle between road and rail continue to be matters of great importance today within the seat of Jandakot, and to a large extent, this was the platform upon which my campaign was based. I'm proud to be part of a government that is serious about achieving tangible improvements to transport and reducing congestion in Jandakot, and that has committed to five long overdue transport projects that will improve travel time and safety. The Thornley to Corbin Rail Extension, with two stations in Canningville, will seriously alleviate congestion on Ranford Road. This was the number one complaint I heard from residents while I door knocked and phone called during my campaign election. The duplication of Armadale Road from Anesty Road to Tapper Road with provisions for future light rail is another major project that will overcome serious congestion and lead to the creation of 850 jobs. The connection of Murdoch Drive to Quinana Freeway and Roe Highway will benefit my constituents' access to Fiona Stanley Hospital and Murdoch Activity Center, which is expected to be the biggest employment center outside the Perth CBD, accounting for 35,000 future jobs. The $217 million Armadale Road to North Lake Road Bridge widening of the notorious congested Carroll Avenue and Leeming and the extra lane north on the Quinana Freeway from Russell Road to Roe Highway are serious congestion busting investments that will create thousands of jobs and help traffic flow around the southern suburbs. The seat of Jandakot is well known for its airport, which has been operating since 1963. Initially established for light plane training, helicopters, charter planes and maintenance, the airport precinct is now a large base for the Royal Flying Doctor Service and has expanded to include a commercial and industrial park occupied by high caliber tenants. Population growth in Janakot has been significant. Today, approximately 28,000 residents call Janakot home. We enjoy a melding of the old and new, rural, and semi-rural land holdings have been transformed into the newer greenfields developments in Treby, Pierre Waters, and Harrisdale. Treby, named after the pioneer family headed by Joseph and Emma Treby, was excised from a former sand quarrying area of Banjab, north of Armadale Road. 
Three of the Treby sons and one grandson served in World War I, with one son killed in action, and the suburb was named in the family's honor. Kalia Estate is the first stage of the new urban development in Treby, which will eventually contain approximately 4,000 new residential dwellings, a town center, and two new primary schools. I was privileged to be an East Ward Councillor for the city of Coburn that resolved to create this exciting new suburb. As a former councillor, I cut my political teeth in local government sector from 2011 to 2015, and the experience has allowed me to truly appreciate the hard work and dedication of mayors, councillors, and staff. Just last week, I was, I was honored to attend the opening of Coburn's $109 million aquatic and recreational center, which is a shining example of how local government can take the lead in providing an outstanding piece of community infrastructure. I am proud that I was part of the council that initiated this project. Especially now, it's open to the public and we expect a million visitors a year. Aside from rates, roads and rubbish, and of course, vital infrastructure, local government is a significant enabler of the successful operation of local community and sporting groups and performs vital work in the community development. Our resident groups and sporting clubs are the heart, soul, and backbone of a community. I'm extremely proud that the McGowan Labor government also recognizes the importance of grassroots organizations and has committed to investing millions in community infrastructure projects in each electorate of the state. In Jandakot, through WA Labor's Local Projects, Local Jobs Initiative, I'm working with Leeming Bowls Club, Pierre Waters Junior Football Club, Her could I ask for an extension, extension Madam Acting Speaker? Thank you. I'm working with the Leeming Bowling Bowls Club, Pierre Waters Junior Football Club, Harrisdale Primary School, Chunghua Chinese School, Armadale Soccer Club, Australia China Youth Business Foundation, Forestdale Sporting Association, and Arch Arch Rugby Club to deliver important upgrades. Particular areas of challenge for local government in which I hope to make a difference during my term include rate disparities within Growth Council and a lack of youth center facilities for a younger generation. Western Australia is a state of migrants. We are a relatively young and diverse state with a bright future. WA is home to people from more than 190 countries, a fact I'm happily reminded at each citizenship ceremony I attend. Recently, at a City of Armadale ceremony, I, I watched people from Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, US, China, and 78 other countries around the world take the pledge, the proud pledge, to become Australian. I talk to migrants every day. They are optimistic and aspirational, and they want to contribute to their communities and to the success of the Australian economy. Members, think back 40 years at the makeup of this parliament and consider the progress that has been attained for West Australians in the time since. We are here today as the 40th Parliament of Western Australia, and I want us to take a moment to imagine the next 40 years, and what is it that we would like to impact upon in that time? As parliamentarians, we are in the privileged position to be able to make decisions that will influence not just the next four years, but the next 40 years of the state's future, and I believe that working towards true multicultural integration is a worthy goal and one I'm committed to advocating for. My electorate of Janicot is punching above, above its weight when it comes to migration populations. In Canningville, Pierre Waters, Forestdale, and Harrisdale, in 2011, the quota of migration was 50% higher than the state's average with more than 42% born overseas. Other suburbs are not far behind. I want the migrant community to know that with hard work, they will get a fair go in Western Australia. As a migrant, 
and a Member of Parliament, I want to help multicultural communities understand how to integrate well. Small business represents around 97% of all businesses in Western Australia, 97%. This is significant as they are a major source of employment and economic activity in the state. As an experienced small business operator, I understand why it is vital to have in Parliament someone who has experienced what it's like to actually be a business owner. There are people in political parties who have come into this chamber saying they know about business and that they represent business, but they have never actually run a business. <laughs> I want small business to have a genuine voice in Parliament. I want them to know that I'm here with an understanding of their experience, their hopes and ambition, their desire to create something, and of course, be aware of the risk they take and the obstacles they face. People often wrongly define what a small business is and how it works. Small business is families, it is mums and dads who are taking on immense risk in following their lifelong dreams and or seeking out financial security for the family's future and contributing significantly to the economy at the same time. They are the nervous system of our community. If you speak to politicians about small business, if you ask them what are the pain points and the issues facing small business owners, some say penalty rates and restrictive work practices, because this is what conservative discourse would have you believe. But I can tell you honestly, as a small business owner, those two items, penalty rates and restrictive work practices, are well down the list of problems. Cutting penalty rates is not going to, not going to make any significant difference to small businesses, yet this issue is monopolizing the entire debate around problems facing the sector. For many small businesses, the husband or the wife themselves, or perhaps a team of two, are the ones working and therefore will simply not be impacted in any meaningful way by penalty rate cuts. Furthermore, often for small business, staff are like family. Owners understand that penalty rate cuts are a fundamental part of compensating their workers for their time they miss out on spending with their families when they have to work on weekends. We need to be very clear in our understanding that the debate around penalty rate cuts has been set up to benefit big businesses with significant number of employees who in reality are the ones that can most afford to pay them. As a small business owner, we know what it's like to get hurt in the retail downturn. We can deal with it and remain optimistic. But what I can't deal with is layers of unnecessary constraints imposed upon small business owners from non-tangible benefits. In fact, what we see is the stifling of small businesses from growing, expanding, and even just operating day-to-day -day with bureaucratic red tape from all three tiers of government. I believe a balance must be achieved so that we have an enabling environment with all three tiers of government that encourage small business to thrive not create death by paperwork, not death by delay, and not death by imposition of unnecessary, burdensome regulations that small business experience on the daily. The issue I'm talking about today are not new. In fact, they were raised to the previous liberal national government, who did very little to help reduce red tape for small business. Currently, small business is defined differently by regulators in Australia, depending on the laws they are administered by. For example, the Australian Tax Office defines a small business as one that has an annual revenue turnover of less than two million. The Australian Bureau of Statistics characterizes a small business as one which employs fewer than 20. ASIC and Fair Work Australia, different definitions again. If four federal agencies cannot agree on the definition of small business, how can government effectively service the sector? How can small business owners clearly understand which rule and regulations apply to their business? People are confused. This sentiment is, is supported by West Australia's underrated small business development corporation, which provides crucial services to small businesses throughout Australia. NWA. 
I would like to thank Small Business Development Corporation for its continuing advocacy and hard work for this long overlooked sector. At the local government level, different councils have different set of rules for small businesses. A food truck operator I know has a business registered with the council area she lives in. Each time she wants to operate her business in another council, she must apply for a temporary food permit and fill out a form to show that her business is compliant with the Food Act and with national food standards. This can take up to three weeks. You have to ask the question, why in 2017 do we have a situation where a business owner is providing identical information over and over again to different councils? The same applies for building approvals that different the same applies for building approvals that differ from one council to another. We could be using available technology to optimize efficiencies by creating a centralized database for this information that state agencies and local government can tap into an update. We must remember, we must remember that small business, businesses are not big businesses. They simply do not have the resource or time available to deal with many of these issues and they certainly should not be disadvantaged or penalized because of this. In my time in Parliament, I want to see more centralized, streamlined processes, as well as some consistency in regulation amongst the three tiers of government to make it easier and smoother for small business owners to meet their compliance requirements and to thrive. Since being elected, I have pulled back, I have pulled back from the family business in order to put all my energy into my work as a member of parliament, and I'm pleased to be able to continue following my passion by providing representation and advocacy in this space. I am proud to be part of a Labour government that makes current and future small business a priority. WA Labour's plan for jobs sets out the strategy to achieve this. Initiatives like enabling small business to compete for government contracts, like increasing support to the micro-businesses that make up nearly 87% of WA small business sector, like removing inappropriate, excessive, and costly regulation by taking measures across the board to increase levels of local content. I am confident that by implementing WA Labour's plan for jobs, small businesses will be made a priority and will be supported to grow and prosper. The journey to becoming a member of parliament cannot be undertaken alone. The outcome of a single day is the result of many years, many days, and many hours of hard work. Assistance and input from friends and family, colleagues, I would like to take some time to show my gratitude to all the people who have helped me along my journey. To my longtime friend and campaign director and member of Coburn, Fran Logan, thank you for your friendship, guidance, and mentorship. Philip Eva, I have more appreciation than you can imagine for your ongoing support, knowledge, and assistance. Thank you. Linda Oshlam, Patrick Gorman, and the WA Labour Party office, without your continued support and hard work, this campaign would not be successful. Creating history, congratulations and thank you. To my campaign team, Dina, Ben, Tespa, BJ, Corey, Corey F, Kiv, Danny, Luke, Santu, Yasso, Naresh, Ashton, Amar, Clara, Janet, Ev, Tarun, Peter, Hunter, Rob, Raj, Salvender, and CJ Matthews, who have been pillar, pillars of strength. Thank you to my elect, electors, officers, and staff, Michelle and Lindsay, for helping me navigate my first few weeks on the job. Josh Wilson, the federal member of, for Fremantle, thank you for your friendship and guidance over many a coffee. There have been many. I would also like to acknowledge the assistance and support of former member of Fremantle, Melissa Park, Member for North Metropolitan Region, the Honorable Alana McTurnan, Federal Member for Bert Matt Keogh, and Member for Armadale, Dr. Tony Booty. To Barry Irvin, Terry Healy, and Pierre Yang, your friendships during the campaign, I'm very grateful for it. Thank you. Particular thanks must go to Steve McCartney from the AMWU, as well as John Welsh from Wapau, Brendan Reeve from ETU, and the respective staff. Thank you. To Kirsten Robinson, Rob Hunter and all the parliamentary staff, thank you for welcoming us. I would like to acknowledge the Council General of India in Perth, Amit Mishra and his wife, Minakshi. 
as well as my sister's childhood friend, Parul Vedak, who's come all the way from India. To my family, especially Lynn Holiday, Bianca and Andre D'Souza, Mersin and Delnaz Gadiali, Ryan and Zinobia Dubash, thank you for... Uh, the question is, is that the motion be agreed to? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for helping me through the tough times, as well as providing invaluable, invaluable campaign assistance. I would not be standing here today if it weren't for the unyielding support of my best friend over the last 20 years, my rock, and the love of my life, my wife, Jerry. Today, alongside my wife and my father, Yazdi, in the public gallery, gallery sits my mother, Shanaz, my sister and my better half, Farizia, her husband, Mirab, my children, Zaishon and MJ, and my niece, Soraya, not forgetting the one, the only, my nephew, Tyrese, who will forever be by my side in spirit. I come to this place with an open mind. I come here to absorb and learn and to work hard for the people of Jandakot and the people of Western Australia. I come here as there's no other country in the world where I would grow and establish myself in the way I have been able to. In Australia, I come here with hope, hope that a farmer's boy from a village in India can be, can be embraced in Australia. Hope that an Indian boy with a surname that no one can pronounce can fit in. <laughs> I also commit to bringing to this place the values upon which I was raised, summarized by the Zoroastrian maximum. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. I would like to conclude with the William Ernest Henley poem, Invictus. This is a poem that Jerry and I read to our children that embodies the characteristics of bravery, resolution, and strength in the face of adversity. Out of the night which covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstances, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you.